Hello, everyone. Um, this is Sabine Giro from uh, Stanford, California. Welcome uh, on behalf of uh, the AO Foundation to this uh, third um, COVID-19 session where we as surgeons exchange experiences from different parts of the world uh, to be able to care for our patients in the best way possible. Uh, I will be moderating this session today together with my cohort moderators, Rafael Cipriano and Anna Tobon. Rafael, do you want to quickly introduce yourself and Anna? Yes, okay. My Sorry, Anna. Uh, my name is Rafael Cipriano. I'm from Vitoria, Brazil. I am an oral maxillofacial surgeon and I am the web editor for the Community Development Commission for AOCMF representing Latin America. And Anna? Um, Hi everyone, um, I am Anna Tovon, oral maxillofacial surgeon from Colombia, and I'm also CV Commission representative for Latin America. So Anna and Rafael um, can take your questions also in Spanish or Portuguese, and then we'll bring them to the audience. Uh, during the session, I would like to ask you to turn off your videos and also your audio because we are expecting a couple of hundred people and it would not be possible to run the session. Please put your questions into the chat and then uh, we will call on you. So now it is my great honor uh, to introduce the president of our AO Foundation, uh, Dr. Robert McGuire, who will give the introduction to this session. Robert. Thank you, Spenny. Now, uh, this is uh, an outstanding program that uh, was started as a community uh, development uh, uh, discussion. And the design of this particular uh, uh, discussion is to present the most up-to-date information on how we as practitioners are managing this crisis in our region and also in our areas. And what we'd like to be able to do is communicate these up-to-date uh, ideas and how we manage these folks and some of the problems that we're finding that we're confronted with. And I think what we're seeing is that we're, uh, we're, we're being confronted with the same issues. And those people that have already uh, been in the, uh, the, the firing line have uh, figured out some ways to, uh, to, to manage their patients and uh, slow down this process. And this is the design of this uh, particular uh, discussion, uh, this, uh, this AO frontline discussion so that we can impart those, uh, those things that the, the people have learned in the, uh, in the firing line, so to speak, and uh, to those that maybe are just getting started on this thing. So uh, Sabine, thank you very much for, uh, for having me. I think this is an outstanding uh, function and from the foundation standpoint, we're extremely supportive of uh, these type of activities. Thank you very much, Bob, also for your support, also from the foundation. So along the lines that you outlined, we have actually invited uh, two of our surgeons from Madrid, Spain. They're working at the same hospital, uh, Martha Redon Marta Redondo and um, uh, Paolo, Paolo. So if you could, Pedro, I'm sorry, if you could introduce yourselves. Marta? Yes. Uh, okay, I am Marta Redondo, a maxillofacial surgeon from, from Spain. I work in, in Madrid and I am AOCMF faculty. And Pedro? Hello everyone, I am Pedro Cava from Spain, former chairman of Altrum Spain and I work as orthopedic trauma surgeon in a big hospital in Madrid. Uh, so Marta and Pedro, I think you're working in the, in the same hospital and we will hear from you in a couple of minutes. Uh, we also have some outstanding uh, distinguished AO faculty from uh, South America. I see uh, Nicolas Somsi, do you want to introduce yourself first? Hi everybody, my name is Nicolas Homsi, oral maxillofacial surgeon from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, uh, working in, uh, at university and private practice. Welcome everybody. And then Juan Emrich. Hi Sabine, hi everybody, thank you for this kind invitation. My name is Juan Emerich, I am neurosurgeon and spine surgeon from Argentina, and I am the actual chair of AO Spine Latin America. And Rodrigo? You have to unmute Hello. yourself. Yep. Okay. You. Hello everyone, my name is Rodrigo Pesantes, I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon in Bogota, Colombia, and I'm the future chair of AO Trauma Latin America. Thank you, Sabine, really for the like invitation. We really like your background. <laughs> so, uh, Marcelo? Yeah, thank you, Sabine, for the kind invitation and for being here. My name is Marcelo Figari from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I'm a head and neck surgeon and 
CMF faculty and currently a member of the foundation board. Thank you. Uh, and then we are missing Honey from um, from Gran Canaria. He's also a um, surgeon from uh, from Spain. So with that, uh, so we have people from all over the world, and I also want to invite the audience. I know that there are people from um, Ecuador and from Bergamo online. I will call on you later to share your experiences. This is really to give a little bit of, you know, sort of speak flesh on the on the numbers that we all know and the uh, and the numbers that we see every day, so that we can share our experience and hopefully uh, be a little bit better prepared. So with that, I would actually like to invite Pedro first uh, to talk about, and uh, maybe uh, Marta, you can also chime in, maybe the two of you can give us a picture of, you know, what is happening in your hospital in the heart of the epidemic in Madrid right now. Yes, he hello all. Yeah, okay. Uh, we don't have much time, so I we go directly. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, so uh, I will try to summarize the current situation in Madrid. So as you know, we are in a lockdown in the whole uh, uh, country from the last three weeks al almost. And just to center the discussion, two weeks ago, we only have 400 cases confirmed in Madrid by 7th of March with very few deaths. And in three weeks, yesterday we have three, uh, 30 thousand cases, more than 4,000 deaths, and we now have 15,000 patients in the ICU uh, yesterday. That figure are yesterday. So in Madrid, we had, at the start of the COVID, 600 ICU beds. Now we have more than 1,500 patients in ICU. So in three weeks, we had to more than double the ICU capacity. So that means that we we turn every post-recovery uh, post -operative, uh, recovery room and almost of the ORs into ICUs or we get the ventilators from the ORs. Um, even with that numbers, uh, today 90% of our ICU capacity is, is full of COVID patients. So we have very, very uh, uh, big problem with the admission criteria for ICU. So every day change. So that's uh, very, very difficult. We have a central committee to decide which patients can go into the ICU and which not. We also, we also opened 12 hotels for patients for the less severe patients. And also we opened a big hospital in the Madrid Expo Center with 1,000 beds. We have almost 900 patients there right now. So this is very important to, to make these charts from the hospitals. <clears throat> and just uh, as an example, my hospital, we have uh, 1,200 beds and now we have 1,000 patients admitted with COVID. Uh, we have more than 100 patients in the ICU. So 80% of the hospital capacity is full of COVID. We, of course, close all the ORs, all the outpatient clinic. And most of the wards in the hospital are for COVID patients. So um, I think the most important uh, information we can share with you is, is where we fail, where we were late about the reorganization of the hospital. So my best um, advice is to anticipate as much as you can. Uh, you don't have to wait the patients to come. Uh, probably 80% of the hospital, if things go like in Madrid, will be for COVID patients. So most of the wards must be converted in to COVID wards, and if you wait as we wait, maybe you have to do that in one or two days. This is very, very difficult, so it's better to anticipate. And it's, the, the best thing is trying to keep a clean or non-COVID area, a small area, area in the hospital and a big uh, COVID area. Also for the air, uh, I think you you maybe need to shut down all the elective surgery. 
uh, you will need all the ventilators for for COVID patients, and also elective patient needs a bed. Uh, can have can have complications, so that that uh, was a mess in the first days in Madrid. Also, the emergency area you have to split into COVID and non-COVID, and that takes a lot of time. And for the outpatient clinic, uh, also it's very important to anticipate. Uh, is uh, if you don't have you, you need to start a, a phone a system to to contact your patients. It's not a good idea to have health patients, healthy patient in the hospital uh, at these times. And I can tell you that uh, most of my orthopedic colleagues who got infected got infected in the first. Uh, week at the outpatient clinic. So always, of course, wear a mask, but this is a, a big problem. So I think Marta could uh, talk now about the CMF and also the protective equipment, the problems we have in the hospital. Marta? Okay, thank you, Pedro. So following what Dr. Cava said, because we work in the, in the same hospital in, in Madrid, if we have to anticipate, it's also important to, an to anticipate and gather all the, the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment as possible for the healthcare workers. Because in, in Spain, we have a really big problem that over 12,000 uh, healthcare workers has been infected. And that number could also be, be a bias because, for example, in, in, in Madrid, only the symptomatic um, doctors are being tested, not, not everyone. So also if you could gather not, not only the protective equipment, but also a, as much diagnostic test as possible, and not only for the healthcare workers, but also for all the population. And in that case, you can, you can have the isolation of the, of the cases and help the, with the spread of the virus. That's very important. Talking about our, our experience in Madrid, about 50% of the doctors have got infected with the, with the COVID uh, virus. And some of our colleagues in our hospitals are already in the, in the intensive care units. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, uh, talking about the trauma team, seven of 40 orthopedic doctors uh, are already infected. At least they have a positive test that we, that we know. And in the maxillofacial team, it's been uh, four of the 19 of us that are infected at home. So uh, as Pedro said, it's important to say that all, most of these cases occurred in the first weeks where we took no, no precautions, we didn't wear masks, and now we are, we are trying to wear the mask and keep the, the social distance, also cleaning our hands and the surfaces and, and wearing the, the protective equipment whenever it's possible. And well, talking about the, our maxillofacial uh, team, I have to say that apart from the ones that are infected at home, we have divided and some of us are in our unit and the others are helping with the pulmonologist and with the internal medicine team in the, in the front line with the COVID patients. And uh, the, the rest ones that are still in our unit, well, uh, due to the confinement, there has been a huge drop in the, in the cases of uh, facial trauma. And also we are trying to follow the, the recent guidelines uh, of pandemia with this and we're trying to be uh, as conservative as, as possible. We have suspended all, all elective uh, surgeries. We are only doing and the days that, we, that, they, give we, that they give us an, an OR because it's not always possible. But the days that we have an OR, we are trying to do only the oncological cases and, and the one that, that we think that are going to compromise the life of the, of the patient. And especially when the, when the surgery involves the upper aerodigestive tract, the, the personal protective equipment is, is, is essential. Also uh, in the outpatient clinics, as, as Pedro said, we are trying that the patients don't, don't come. We are trying to do the telematic medical consultation, which is possible in, in the great majority of, of patients. And because of our specialty, we have been trained right now in, in protocols and and how to perform the, the tracheostomies in the intubated COVID patients that um, the intensive care doctors and anesthesiologists in charge of these patients, they, they request it more frequently. Every day we have, uh, we have uh, uh, some of them. And uh, this, is, um, this is a procedure with a high risk of, of contagion because of the aerosolization of the viral particles. So in these procedures, we are trying to be very it, we are trying to use the, the highest level of the personal protective equipment as, as possible. So, Pedro? 
if you want to continue with your team. Uh, Peter, you are muted. Can you please turn on your video or your audio? Just a few final words about the trauma admissions. So what we noticed in the first week is a dramatically decrease in admissions. So for example, last week, last weekend, we don't have any admission at all. And normally we have maybe 20 during the weekend. So no, no, high, no high energy trauma, only hip fractures and hip fractures could be a big problem because some patients came in with hip fracture and also with the COVID. Uh, those patients in our experience, we are um, doing a study, we, we will try to have results in a week. Uh, the prognosis is very, very bad. Also, um, I think that, and also for uh, things that, uh, orthopedic surgeons can do to help because we are not of much help in the internal medicine world. Uh, for example, we have teams of orthopedic surgeons to prone patients. Pronation of patients is, is uh, uh, one of the most effective measures in these patients. And you can imagine the, the amount of manpower you need for more than 100 patients in the ICU and one 1,000 admitted patients, if you have to prone every day, two times the patient. So we have residents doing this with uh, completely protected to help the, the ICU. And also the youngest doctors are working in the wards, helping the internal doctors. Uh, I think this is the most important uh, points I, I, I wanted to 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 give to you okay thank you so much pedro and marta um honey you are also in spain do you want to add something to this uh, to this to what the picture they are painting how yeah. is the situation where you are yeah thank you sabine uh, well uh, uh, i'm honey Maidley from uh, from spain as uh, you mentioned uh, i'm orthopedic spine surgeon and uh, president of the uh, sp past president of the Spanish spine society and now a president of Latin American and Iberian Spine Societies. So I'm here at La Palmas, a spine surgeon in the hospital. And uh, well, um, uh, Pedro and Marta uh, detailed uh, very well the, the situation. I, I would like to, to add like two or three uh, big issues. Uh, yeah, sure, now, now we're, we are struggling and fighting co uh, uh, to contain the, the, the coronavirus. Uh, flattening the curve of new infections now it's, it's, it's uh, the purpose of, in order to lower the morbidity and the mortality of, of patients. Uh, the, our clinical uh, management is mainly supportive. As you know, there is no treatment. We have no treatment for that. There is no uh, vaccine. And the situation is very, very, very scary. I give you an example. The head of the country's emergency coordinators, coordination center, he, 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 who, who gives us the instructions how to avoid the infection, he was tested positive three or four days ago. That means that the situation is very, very scary. Uh, another issue, what, what about uh, the rapid tests? As you know, are very important to, to have rapid uh, tests in order to control uh, patients. And uh, Spanish health authorities said la uh, last week that they have returned a shipment of a rapid diagnostic tests purchased from China after they were found to be unreliable in detecting the virus. That means that we have some delay in the diagnosis, some delay in the management and treatment of those patients. Another big issue is Spain now, we have the highest number of, of medical workers infected, double than Italy. And Italy is not good, but Spain is double. Now we are 15%. Italy maybe 78% and China recognized 4%. This is a very important thing to think about it. Why that happened? Why this is happening? Because, because we have like almost 14,000 healthcare workers are infected by the virus. And this is a minor, not minor issue because those, they may infect the patients and their families and, and, and there's a personal drama. As, as Pedro said, how we can have six or seven orthopedic surgeons in a team, they have infection. This is a terrible issue. And uh, uh, maybe because of lack of, of personal uh, protective equipment and, and 
are other issues to, to, to be analyzed, to be analyzed. And well, we have to be prepared for the worst as there's an uncertainty continues here in Spain. Always we know that the next weekend will be the worst than the previous weekend. So the situation is critical. We hope that one day we see the peak of the wave, of the curve, but we hope that next week maybe, and, and, and this is, by the moment, is, the curve is a steep curve. Thank you very much, Hani. I think, um, you know, I, I, what, came, what became to me at least very clear is, um, and I think also when I talked to Pedro in preparation for this meeting, he was saying, you know, we were thinking something will happen in three days and then it happened tomorrow. You know, I, I think we're all in this situation. I remember like two weeks ago, I was in New York trying to go to a meeting and then everything was canceled. And now we're sitting here and having, you know, hundreds of patients also in Santa Clara. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the explosiveness of this, of, of the development is, is really hard to grasp. And I think that's something that, um, you know, we all feel a little bit overwhelmed with. And it's, of course, extremely concerning what you were reporting from Spain that so many healthcare workers are infected. Yeah, you know, as you were saying, likely it's, it's uh, you know, because we started too late implementing, implementing uh, increased, um, you know, protection for our, for our colleagues. Also, I don't know, that actually was one of my questions. It seems like, you know, of course, testing is very important. And um, so one of the questions I wanted to ask Marta and Pedro, is testing now available for every patient that comes to the hospital? How do you handle that? You know, if you have to go to surgery, do you know whether this person is infected or not? Uh, yes. Um, on, on the first week, we, we didn't have a test for every patient. Now it's uh, compulsory to have a test to, to go to the OR with the patient because otherwise the anesthesiologist uh, don't want to, to do it. And also we have a COVID OR and non-COVID OR and we try to keep it uh, like this. So if we have a suspected patient without test, for example, a pneumonia, we go to the COVID even if we don't have the test. So yeah. that's very, very important. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's that's an, a very important point. Is is you know in your hospitals uh, testing for patients also we go to surgery, mm -hmm. especially to upper respiratory tract surgery for oral maxillofacial surgeons, you know ENT surgeons, and uh, everybody who goes through the oropharynx the anesthesiologists you know, to have uh, testing available. Uh, otherwise, go to maximum uh, protective equipment like peppers or, or you know, um, face shields and masks and N95 masks or equivalents yeah. uh, is necessary, especially if you're working in the upper respiratory tract. Of course, you know, it's better to know whether, how, whether, you are, whether there is something uh, going on in that patient or not. That's really one of, the, one, of the, one of the critical points I think that we all need to make and all need to understand. Uh, I have another question for you. Did you actually, with so many health workers in, in, uh, infected also, are you breaking up in teams so that if one team gets infected, you still have backup teams or how do you handle this situation no we, we try we try to do it in the beginning but uh, it's very difficult to maintain because you don't know who is going to get infected so what we try is to 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 maintain someone at home in case but uh, i think it's not necessary because um there are enough doctors in the hospital to deal with this. It's not the problem of doctors, it's more about ventilators, ICU beds, and nurses. Yeah. So uh, just uh, be very careful. And yeah. I, I don't think this is a good idea to, to try to do this. It's very difficult, very, very difficult. So I think one of the things that you also, in the preparation to this meeting, uh, brought up is that uh, now you have, I think you said we have we have only three working ORs, and the rest of the ORs are all ICU beds. Right? That, that's so. That's one of the things I wanted to ask you and Marta as well. How did you? Maybe Marta, you can comment on that. How did you surge from um, eighty ICU beds? You said to now over a hundred or something. How did you accomplish that? What how, What did you do organizationally in your hospitals? I think that would be a great learning point for everybody who is at the beginning of the epidemic. And, and you know, I think the other learning point I want to come back to, if you have very few people right now, you need to anticipate and protect your teams and start using yes. more protective equipment. So Marta, do you want to comment on the, on the surge, how that was accomplished? I mean, on, on the number of ICU beds, as you said. Yeah, we, how, did you, how did you get so many more ICU beds? How, what did you do? 
because we just, with all the other surgeries completely suspended, but just the ones that compromise in life, we use all the ICU places that before they were for coronary patients or for uh, transplanted patients or uh, every other patient that needed. Now they, we are just leaving them for the, for the COVID patients. Also the ventilators used in the ORs that are now used for, the, for these patients and they are trying to to uh, have a ICU beds wherever they are possible. I think in our, in our hospital, they're still not using a respirator for uh, a ventilator for two patients. I think they're still not, not, not doing that. And uh, on the other thing that you comment in our maxillofacial team at the beginning, we tried to keep some people at home so as to keep them without the virus. But, but now that we have some of us infected and uh, other of us are, are, are trying to help in the, with the internal medicine teams, um, and now we are beginning to do the tracheostomy. That's not really, most of us are, are coming, even though the maxillofacial work with the patients and the, our, our proper ORs, uh, there has been a huge drop in, in that numbers. Okay, thank you so much. I would now, now like to, I, there's one question that I want to, I'm sorry? Quick comment on, on this issue uh, from Spain. Yes. Uh, just uh, to tell you that specialties are not on the front line. We are dividing 50%, yes. they are no need to stay there. So no yes. outpatient clinic, we do it by telephone. And, and the worst scenario is when you have a patient emergency and you don't know if he has or not the coronavirus. And yes. you, are not, you are not able to do that test. This is the worst scenario that we are faced. Yeah, that's why I brought this up at the beginning, that this is a crucial thing that needs to be happening in all hospitals. Yes. I mean, of course, for the whole population, but given the shortages of even nasal swaps, you know, that's a real problem. So I want to continue on. I want to bring something back later. That's the question of tracheostomy, yes or no. But first of all, let's go to, uh, to our colleagues who are here from different countries. So Rodrigo and Fernando, you are from Colombia. You know, what is, uh, the, um, what is the situation there right now? And I think, Rodrigo, you were born in Ecuador, you said, and there's also a colleague um, I, I saw online who is from Ecuador, and we heard um, you know, that the situation in Ecuador is really very dire, um, that we cannot imagine. Um, but uh, maybe, Rodrigo, you want to get started? Okay, Sabine, thank you very much. Yeah, we, we have... Uh, in Bogota, thousand, in Colombia, 1,000 people that is infected, uh, 97 people whose death. In Ecuador, it's 3,200 people that is infected, 120 deaths. Uh, we, in Bogota, in, in my hospital, we prepare. We are in teams in the orthopedic trauma team. We are three orthopedic trauma surgeons, and we keep just one of the residents. And we, too, go every other day to take a look at the patients, at least just for a week. And then the next week is the other one at the next week. So you have one week on and two, and two weeks off. And uh, we only take care of emergencies. We don't have enough tests. So we don't test every patient, just the patients that are symptomatic. And uh, I, we don't have, as, as Pedro does, uh, COVID special OR. We just have one OR and we're taking just care of basically emergencies. But on the other hand, really trauma has been coming down basically to zero. Uh, we are just taking care of low energy fractures, hip fractures that need to be treated, other fractures, some of them would just get splinted and then we'll take care of later on. So you basically also, do, uh, basically um, your, your, your treatment is now more conservative, so, so the situation is influencing how you make treatment decisions, is that correct? Uh, not necessarily, Sadine, but if there's something that we can push off and then uh -huh. wait a little bit, then we wait. But uh, let's say if we have a pelvic fracture, a hip fracture, a femur fracture shot, then we'll try to fix it immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you want to com comment from Medellin, uh, where you are? But I think I understand that in, in Colombia, you are still behind the curve from what we are seeing from Spain. And I think I cannot emphasize enough from Pedro and from, from Marta, you know, how the situation changes rapidly. Yeah, much more rapidly than we all anticipate. You look at the numbers and you should be able to grasp that. But I think the, the step from looking at numbers that we all do at, as, as physicians to really experiencing it, that, you know, we are basically, you know, um, we are, this is a, such an overwhelming uh, speed. Yeah, I think uh, in, in countries like Colombia, we're a little bit, you know, behind the curve. I think you need, this is really important information for you. So, Anna, do you want to comment on how this situation is in Medellin? 
Oh, Sabine, actually, um, it's mostly the same as Rodrigo said before. The, we are taking, uh, we are now in the phase of mitigar uh, the, the COVID, but uh, we are expecting to receive more help from outside because we don't have enough PPI for health workers. We don't have uh, any UK uh, protectives, so we just beginning. We just beginning, but it's pretty much the same as Rodrigo says. Thank you, uh, Marcelo uh, and Juan. Uh, situation in in Argentina. Where do you stand right now, Marcelo? Do you want to start? Yeah. Well, uh, we are we are just starting because nowadays Argentina has uh, eleven hundred infected. Uh, people and 34 deaths. That means that um, we were able, uh, knowing exactly the experience that uh, the rest of the world uh, had, uh, to to have a very early lockdown of, of our city and, a, and a, an early quarantine. And yes, this is positively affecting the, the curve of infected people that will really be not so heavy. But we, are, we have planned now to prepare for the worst that we foresee can come in the second April, uh, half at the beginning of March. Um, in my hospital, in terms of uh, preparation, we were already able to, to cancel all elective procedures as uh, all the previous speakers commented. And uh, we are trying to, to make teams, uh, combining one staff, one fellow, and one resident, and they, they, they are available one week, and then mm -hmm. uh, at home two, two weeks. This will be possible at the beginning, probably later, later or not. And uh, we are trying to optimize resources as much as possible in terms of uh, rational use of N95 masks and um, protection uh, in order to select exactly the level of uh, protection that uh, each clinical situation has. It sounds like you have, you have really learned from, from the international situation and, and I commend that uh, uh, Argentina to, uh, to make these decisions so early. I think Juan, you, you also agree with that? What, what is your experience and your assessment? Yeah, you know, for, for us it's like something different. We usually never follow the good examples, but that time we start very early. You know, our, the people and the government take this very, very seriously. And we probably three weeks ago, we stopped all the activities and that was make a big difference. In my hospital, we split in teams as well. You know, right now it's like three minutes before the kickoff of an important game. Everybody's waiting, everybody's prepared. But until now, really we don't have too much cases as Marcelo already said. And we try to take this one time life opportunity to learn from Europe and, and China to be as prepared as possible. But when we listen things like Marta and Pedro for Spain, we are extremely concerned, not only in Argentina, Latin America, because if this is hitting so bad, the, the Europe and North America, with the, the poverty we usually have here and lack of resources, some countries as city hubs, we are extremely concerned, you know? In some way, we are, we are lucky because we have time, but uh, I believe I share this uh, feeling with the rest of my colleagues from Latin America. We are extremely concerned when this hit and hit very bad, probably, how we're going to deal with this, you know, the lack of resources and it's, it's a game change, you know, we, we are looking how you are dealing in America, Sabine, uh, to, to, to learn as well. And, you know, we are prepared and we are waiting. Everybody cross fingers, but you can see our faces. <laughs> Everybody's worried here. And we yeah. learn from the best. That is the idea of this kind of work. Well, I think Argentina has shown that you, are doing, that you are doing really well and learning and that your government is listening and taking the right steps. And I think that's going to make a huge difference in the, in the uh, uh, you know, in the long run and also maybe with your resources. I would now like to go to Brazil, where, of course, I hear the situation is completely different. Nicolas, Nick, do you want to start? Uh, well, in Brazil, we are, we already, uh, we are having, by today, almost 7,000 cases, uh, 20, uh, 240 deaths, 
this is a 3.5% rate. But the problem that we are, we are underestimating because we are, we are having a lack of the tests. And uh, in the beginning, our president were a little bit uh, controversial about the topic. But uh, thank goodness our Minister of Health is a, is a good guy, is a well-prepared guy, and he's putting things into order. But uh, the lack of PPE, uh, the extortive higher prices, like, uh, and uh, we had 95% of our PPEs came from China. And uh, this week, the US has, uh, has bought a, a huge quantity of, of PPEs from China. And we're not receiving them anymore. We were, we were uh, let down by this lack of respirators and uh, a, a, an horizontal lockdown of all of, uh, of uh, dental practice offices, surgery practices, our hospitals. Uh, we are not operating any elective case, just urgencies and emergencies. And uh, as well as uh, other uh, Latin American countries, the lack of money and uh, information will hit us uh, uh, a bit uh, more harder than, uh, than, uh, than other countries. But uh, we are hoping things are getting better because people are really isolated. Uh, we are in almost total isolation. Uh, the streets are empty. The trauma cases uh, are, uh, are not uh, coming as usual. But many dental emergencies like uh, infections, pain, and uh, many other those things are being treated. And uh, today the government set a, a, a call for all health professions to, to reinforce the, the team uh, playing against COVID. And maybe uh, things are running like this, like this way. All of our states, all of our 27 states uh, have uh, infected cases. Uh, but uh, I cannot tell you that the numbers are, are correct because just by today we, are, we have 23,000 exams to be uh, released. So the tests are not coming in a, in a good velocity. The quick tests are, uh, did not arrive as uh, in time. So some people say we have the double three times more than the statistics show. Uh, and, and, and we hope it's not true, but uh, states with high economical movement like Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro are increasing the cases day by day in, in like uh, a thousand cases per day. So are, you, those, uh, are you in lockdown right now or people are still freely about, about and about? You're in lockdown now? No, we are, we, we are in horizontal lockdown. Everybody is in lockdown. Uh -huh. uh, only uh, urgent services are, are permitted to work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rafael, do you want to add something to uh, Nicolas' impression? Are you muted? I believe Nicholas uh, said almost everything. Uh, we are um, now at the, in our tenth day of quarantine, of complete lockdown. You know, uh, the the increase of the the cases are increasing, but not in the velocity that we are expecting. Because in some way, somehow, our health minister. Uh, found a way to keep things as uh, to, to, the, the curve did not increase as higher as we imagined but uh, this this kind of things happening we are having as Nicola said about 250 cases uh, deaths here in, in, in Brazil and we are optimizing as much as we want as we can the PPE because this uh, last, last news about uh, the U.S. buying this huge amount of PPE from China completely uh, left us uh, uh, without hope, you know, not, not without hope, but uh, it really got us surpri very surprised because yep. we're expecting a huge amount of PPEs. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for giving the impressions from your countries. I think, uh, you know, it looks like, um, you know, you all waiting for this for the tsunami to hit in, yeah. uh, in one uh, in one way or another um, and uh, you know of course uh, the critical shortages of PPE testing and all these kinds of things is uh, you know we are unprepared to 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 take this on it's very obviously obvious from a healthcare perspective uh, and we have to make do with the best we can
Uh, I want to bring in, uh, so there was a colleague, uh, I actually want to bring in out in the audience, Anna and, and Rafa, I think there was a colleague from Ecuador, and I also saw that there is a colleague from Bergamo, which is at the, at the, uh, at the center of, of the epidemic right now, and I was wondering whether these two colleagues have any recommendations to the countries that are still awaiting, uh, the, um, uh, awaiting the, the worst to come. Oh yeah, there's Claudio Bernucci. Claudio, do you want to uh, comment? Can you introduce yourself? Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, I'm the director of the neurosurgical department in Bergamo, and I'm an home spine faculty for, the, for Italy. Uh, uh -huh. As a neurosurgeon, we deal with the, the head trauma and also with spinal trauma and every kind of neurosurgical procedure. Uh, the good news <coughs> is that uh, we are reaching the, the end of the six week since the first case. We have our first case on the 22 of February. And by the beginning of this week, we are seeing very, very good improvement in the situation. Uh, I mean, uh, um, we, uh, we are nowadays in our emergency department, the patient, the COVID patient are clearly uh, are dropped in the number in respect to the, the previous week. During the first uh, week of the infection, uh, we had to reduce uh, our, um, our activities. And by the, 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 the 10th of, the, of March, we stopped any surgery, uh, not only spinal surgery, but also cranial surgery. And uh, we, we, we can say that uh, during the first uh, three weeks, the three uh, and four weeks, there would have been a, a, a steep curve of increasing cases, and we uh, completely changed our, uh, the, our hospital. We have uh, uh, 900 beds, and uh, by the first uh, week, uh, we filled uh, uh, 50 beds. By the second, we reached uh, 150, and then we arrived at uh, 400 beds in the world and uh, almost uh, 90 beds in the intensive care unit. So we completely dev devote ourselves to the, to the COVID uh, patient. And uh, by the second week, uh, uh, almost uh, half of every specialty has to send uh, his, uh, uh, its, uh, its doctor to help uh, the pneumologist, the intensivist, and the and the other uh, and the other doc and the inf infectious disease uh, doctors. Have you uh, seen increased infection of healthcare workers in your hospital, and, and which uh, which ones were um, were high were more inf more affected than others? You know, there is this thing that uh, people uh, the, the viral load uh, that people experience are surrounded with may play a, uh, may play a role, and also you know that uh, everybody who is working in the head and neck is 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 more exposed. Um, to has a higher risk of, of being infected um, if not uh, appropriate PPE is available. Yes, indeed, we we the, the we had many uh, doctors infected, especially in the between the intensivists. Uh, the surgeon was were quite uh, spared by the by the infection. Uh, yeah. Probably we were more aware of the problem uh, by the first day. The other things uh, that we we learned it was that. Uh, uh, the di diagnosis is not based only on the swab, on the, on the test, but if you have a, a negative test and if you have a positive X-rays or a CT scan, the patient is a COVID patient. And that's, and that's the other. The other things we learn uh, uh, is that uh, there is a sort of uh, three phases in the, in the disease. The first phase is the typical viral uh, disease phase where you have uh, a rise of the, of the, of the viral uh, of the real infection. The second phase is a phase of uh, uh, where there is a, an immune response by the host that can give a lot of problem. And the third phase is the heart disease problem, uh, the, dis the dysfunction of the respiratory uh, system. So uh, we changed also our protocol of therapy because uh, nowadays the, f the first uh, therapy for the patient uh, who arrives with the infection is the antiviral therapy with the uh, hydroxychloroquine and the uh, uh, azithromycin. Then you move to uh, other, uh, other um, drug, especially tocilizumab that you, you use it to, to, 
to work against the autoimmune response of the patient and also low dose heparin, but uh, very high level of low dose heparin because we, we, we saw many patients with very, very unbelievable level of d dimer in the blood and they are at uh, very uh, a risk of a thrombolic event, not only on the lung, but also on the renal failure and also in the, sometimes also in the, the brain. So, so as, as head and neck surgeons so, and, and CMF surgeons, we are also very interested in, do you trach everybody? Uh, trach, uh, what do you mean? Uh, tracheostomy, do you do tracheostomies in these patients? Uh, no, no, the, most of the, 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 the tracheostomy are, are, are done by the intensivists, but they, they don't do the, the, the tracheostomies very often because usually uh, when, when a patient is in the, in the intensive care unit, it takes about between 10 and 14 days to, to, to come out from this equation. So uh, usually they don't, uh, they don't perform tracheostomy. Okay, yeah, that's, that's very interesting because, so for example, Marta was reporting that at their hospital, it's a more routine procedure for these patients. And of course, it's exposed with high risk. And yes, of course. I hear, hear more what you are saying from, from, from all colleagues over for, the world. For example, by, by, the, by, by a neurosurgical <laughs> point of view, we, we stopped any transphenoidal endonasal procedure, endoscopic procedure. Yeah, they are very, very dangerous for the surgeon, even with, with the appropriate PPE. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. That, that was very interesting. Thank you so much, Claudio, for coming on and, and sharing that information with us. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. I want, to, I want to do the next round and focus a little bit on the shortage of PPE respirators and, and so on and so forth. So, um, Bob, there already was a couple of times mentioning of, um, you know, sharing respirators between different patients. Um, I, I know that, that you are also looking into that and, and maybe you can share your insights on this. And, and I would also like to invite somebody from the audience or, or from the panel, if you have experience with that, speak, please speak up, uh, talk to Anna and, and, uh, and, uh, and Raphael so that we can bring you on. Okay, uh, Bob, do you wanna uh, take that question? Sure, sure. I think there's, uh, there's a couple of things that are going on uh, in, the, in the US right now and the, uh, the sharing of respirators is uh, one of those ideas. Uh, those are for the dire circumstances. That's uh, a situation, uh, if you look at uh, percentages of uh, the numbers that I've seen, is it if you, uh, if you have to share a ventilator, then that puts both uh, patients in a little bit more of a risk uh, uh, of dying. And so we're trying to stay away from that as much as possible in the, uh, in the US, but it certainly has been, uh, been approved for that uh, to occur. One of the things that we are looking at, uh, certainly at the University of Mississippi, is we had one of our pediatric uh, uh, anesthesiologists uh, come up with a plan where you're using uh, items that you can find at a hardware store. It has a three-way solenoid, and these patients that are ventilated, they're then uh, uh, hooked to a uh, basically a, a pressurized oxygen tank. And with pressure valves, timing, and this solenoid, this uh, device is working for them. I was hoping that we would have it uh, finalized today for this discussion. It's going through uh, an evaluation by the uh, FDA. And as soon as, uh, uh, as soon as this is released, I'm going to be able to send this to, to all of our members uh, in the, uh, within the, uh, the AO. And these, uh, we have a hundred of these devices right now. Uh, we've got all of our materials at uh, Home Depot, and uh, they, they're less than, uh, less than $200 a piece to be able to make these. So hopefully in the, in the very near future that uh, we'll be able to pass this information on to everyone. They're easily made. The, the parts and pieces are easily obtained. And as far as there was uh, some concern about the, uh, the PPEs, uh, that also there's processes now that are in place for uh, rapid sterilization of these uh, the PPEs so that they can be reused. And uh, that is now starting to be widely accepted. So I think uh, make sure that your administrators within your, uh, you know, your hospital areas are aware of this and uh, the, the, where they can be sent for uh, sterilization and reuse. Yeah, I think uh, that that's very important. And of course, these are the kind of ingenuity, ingenious ideas 
that are very important for all of us. If you can go to the hardware store and put something together that is helpful, that is, that is of course fantastic. And I would like to point out uh, that uh, you, know, you can find this information on the AO Foundation website. And uh, so we are also posting some uh, re-sterilization and things like that, healthcare worker guidelines uh, here in the chat that you can download uh, from Stanford um, that are very helpful in that regard with the uh, protocols and so on and so forth. And go to our AOCMF uh, Facebook site for continued discussion. We will also there, um, you know, post all these information in the coming weeks and you can also ask your questions there. So we're trying to keep an interactive forum in addition to these Thursday meetings. Um, so there is, uh, does anybody else have anything to add around the uh, sharing of ventilators? Does anybody have any, um, you know, uh, practical experience with that, with that right now? Or are you using that at your hospital? Um, is there anybody who wants to add to this uh, topic? Or otherwise, we'll bring it up uh, next week again. Sabine, if yep. I may. Can I yes, ask please. something? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask to the audience because as I've heard what they're doing in, in Italy from Claudio, if what are their experience with the with the tracheostomies? Because for us, the, the intensive care doctors, they they believe that for a lot of patients, the, the tracheostomy will help them to get off the ventilator faster because we all know it, it will take like at least two weeks for most of them. And also for to manage the, the airway because they, they got a lot of obstruction of the of the tubes. So they, they are asking for a lot of them. And I would like to know if this is happening in other, in other countries or, or if anyone has experience with this. Anybody want on, on the panel want to comment on that? Yeah, go ahead, Marcelo. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, a, this is a big discussion around the topic, uh, Marta. I agree with you that sometimes the intensive care unit doctors push to have a tracheostomy a little bit early, but uh, we need to see the other aspect, and the tracheotomy is a very dangerous procedure for the operator, for the surgeon here. And most of the pro protocols regarding COVID infection are uh, suggesting that the tracheotomy should be delayed as much as possible, even, even longer than the normal period we use, that was 14 or 15 days. There are protocols speaking about 21 or 22 days. Um, after the patient had been intubated when it's absolutely necessary to, to change the tubes for, for a tracheotomy and trying to have a negative test of this patient before the procedure is, is done. And is the protocol we are trying to adopt in, in our hospital. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from anybody else? Is there anybody in the audience who would like to comment on this, Anna or, or Rafael? Uh, Sabine, uh, I would like to, to talk to you if you want to talk with Simon. He's from Ecuador. Yeah. He's waiting okay. to, to share yeah. about the, the, his experience. So, Simon, can you just turn on your microphone, please, and talk to us? And video, yeah. if you have. And video also. Uh, Sometimes you were on before. Yeah, please turn on your video. Uh -huh. Turn on your video, please, Simon. I started. I started by saying you, uh, the host is stopped. Okay, oh. I will. Okay. Hello. Here we are. Hi, Simon. Can you introduce yourself? Yes. Yeah, greeting, greeting to the all uh, AO Foundation representative and the webinar attendant. Uh, my name is Simon Chan. I'm, I'm a Venezuelan spine orthopedic surgeon living in Guayaquil, Ecuador, since uh, two years. Um, the, situ the, the actual situation uh, is kind of difficult to explain because uh, we here uh, we are having like a two system of, of, of public health healthcare system, like uh, the social healthcare system and the, the, the public one. Also the private uh, system, right? But the, the, there's some part of the, uh, of this, the, the, the northern part of the Guayaquil is like a more, the higher strata socioeconomical situation and stick, they, they stick to the, to the normative, the normative and the, the prohibition to go out or follow the recommendation. But in the southern part of Guayaquil, if the less, the most, uh, the poor people, and they, I, I think they don't have that kind of, 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 of culture, culture to, to, to stick to that kind of situation. Though, though the, the government and the, the local uh, 
head, head, head uh, uh, members of the of the city is uh, always is, uh, say the the recommendation to stick uh, to to follow. Uh, the, the thing is the uh, it is getting out of control of the both of the social social uh, healthcare system and the public healthcare system. So the the about the they're trying to to restrict the population getting infected, but also in in this in this uh, situation they they don't doing another type of of, of regular uh, uh, thing that they moves like uh, the corpse in the street. I don't. I haven't seen it by myself but because I in the in, uh, in the lockdown uh, in the northern part of it. Well, it's it's a beer that is is getting worse. So far to the today, they're they're saying the the national risk operating committee that they have in like a three thousand uh, infected, three thousand maybe positive and to the, uh, 200 uh, uh, casualties from the COVID, where I think it's worse. And maybe they, they, they have, they have uh, registered that, that info, that data. Thank you I, so I am not- I think, okay. I, I think that, uh, that, is, uh, that is really a glimpse into, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm maybe, I'm maybe frank into, into countries that have very low resources and where, you know, population, large populations live under marginal conditions, which is probably also, uh, Nicolas, for, 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 for Brazil, for large areas. And, and um, as far as I'm familiar, of course, you know, with the area. And I think that's going to be also one of the big problems in a lot of the Asia Pacific and African countries. So um, so, can yeah, I ask enough? you something to Thanks. Simon? Yeah. Uh, Simon, uh, what, what about these bodies that you are talking? We are seeing on news that they can rest on the street like four days, five days, and it becomes a other health problem, you know? So how you try to resolve this? Because they, they just threw in the bodies outside the houses and the streets. There is no way to to bury them or i'm going to speak in spanish because it's sí. easier to explain for me eh, la situación la situación es que el los entes públicos no pueden eh, están lidiando con la situación en los hospitales hay dos hospitales dos grandes hospitales que son al sur de, de guayaquil que son los que están eh, eh, recibiendo la, la mayor cantidad de población con el covid pero aparentemente la, la policía, la parte pública y los servicios de, de salud están enfocados a la parte de la atención de la, de la población en esos sectores. Y han, and, uh, y han descuidado. You, I'm sorry, can you please quickly summarize for our English audience? And I think yes. that's also getting to the end. So unfortunately, we have to wind down our discussion a little bit. Okay. But I think, Simon, these are very important points. And that's why I'm saying, you know, uh, we need to look at uh, situations where, you know, there is really no health care available for a, lot, for a large population. And then how to deal this with this on, a, on an even different level. So, Anna, do you just want to quickly summarize what, what Simon to, uh, told well, us? What Simon says is, is that right now the government is pretty much uh, pointed to detect the positive cases, but besides that, the population of ground part of Guayaquil who's dying, they don't, they don't, they right now don't care about it, and they try to manage the bodies, but at least. They started as a hair, Simon, that some of them are, are burned, burned the bodies outside, like people are burning the, their own relatives. Yeah, but, but I don't think it's yeah. not because the government it doesn't take care of them. I think it's because the government doesn't have the, 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 the resources, the, the, yeah. the research to, de to deal yeah. I, I, yeah, I think the that, whole situation exactly. Yeah, I think that's a very important point, and we should keep that in mind. Um, so, with that, you know, this is actually going to be the, our discussion next week. So, we're going to have these um, frontline meetings every week now. 
Uh, in the meantime, you can join us on Facebook or through the AO Foundation on the AO sites, and we can continue our discussion there. We are sharing resources. You know, we posted uh, the resources that we have here available from uh, from the um, uh, from Stanford, um, which are very good. But next week we will focus on um, how to manage, uh, you know, the the countries and areas where the resources are even less than what we have here. And so we have invited a, um, a Stanford uh, former. Um, uh, uh, commander of the Afghanistan uh, campaign and um, of the who is the medical director uh, of one of the hospitals here and he's a form, former medical commander in the in the in the army uh, of the United States a very high-ranking officer and he has a lot of experience uh, with of course you know urgent combat combat and um, you know making available resources in very very low uh, resource countries and so we will, go, we will focus and zoom in on that a little bit more also to uh, get our countries that have very low resources uh, prepared for this. And we need all of your ideas, like what Bob was saying, you know, get stuff from Home Depot, you know, how can we put things together? These are the ideas that we need right now um, because, you know, we are basically, like one of my colleagues said last week, um, we are flying the plane while we are building it. Yeah, and uh, we are not prepared uh, for this situation right now. With that, I would like to thank our audience uh, and also our panelists who joined us today for this uh, for this discussion, and especially uh, the sponsorship and help and uh, from um, uh, the uh, level of the foundation, uh, Dr. Robert McGuire, the president, and uh, also our team, uh, Raluca Heron and, and uh, Laura Leibo, who've been working in the background to pull all of this together. And again, please uh, join us again ne next week. Um, we will uh, continue on this conversation. And in the meantime, uh, we can also, you can all join us uh, on our permanent discussion forums on Facebook, and we will try to make as much uh, information available there. With that, uh, thank you very much, everybody. And um, we will see you next week. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.